All right, let's get started. So this morning, we're continuing our series of change. This is our last message in this series of change, uh, which was entitled, I'll do it tomorrow, finding the power to change. So we've looked at that when we have an understanding of procrastination, that dirty big word that we spoke on last week, sanctification and the power of cultivating spiritual habits, we will see the life-giving process of change in a Christian life. First, we looked at how change is unavoidable. So our first week, we looked at how change is unavoidable and how it happens in each of our lives and it just happens. There's nothing that we can do, whether we want it or not. And we discussed how it can either bring us closer to God, we can use these moments to draw and strengthen our relationship with God, or we can allow it to take us further away from Him and that ultimately we're responsible for that, that we're responsible for following God through every season and appointed time in our lives. We then looked at how being a Christian and living a Christian life is about changing to reflect Jesus more through a process of sanctification. How as soon as we become a Christian, we start this process of change to become more like Christ. It's a process that takes commitment, it takes perseverance and it takes time. Last week we looked at procrastination how it can hinder change when we put off responsibilities for another time. So when we put off our responsibilities for another time, it can hinder our ability to change. We said that procrastination isn't necessarily just being lazy, but it can be a symptom of deeper, unaddressed feelings, of boredom, inadequacy or self-doubt. Or it could simply be we just don't want to do the task, so we're putting it off. There's a whole range of reasons why we procrastinate. When we allow procrastination to become a defining habit, it can shift us off the path God intended for us, like it did with King Saul. This week we look at the final component of our series. The final part of our series plays such an important role. The topic that we're looking at today plays such an important role in our spiritual lives. Uh, It can be said that if sanctification is the engine driving change within us. If sanctification is that engine that's working all the time in us, slowly bringing change in our lives, then today's topic would be the fuel that drives that engine. This week we look at spiritual disciplines or habits. So our spiritual habits, what are we doing spiritually every day that helps fuel that process of sanctification? So after spending the last three weeks looking at how change is inevitable, how God through the Holy Spirit works from the inside out to change us to be more like Christ, and that change happens, and, and, and what happens when we put off that change, when we procrastinate on that change, now we're going to look at how we can help that change. What can we do to help change? So what do we do to change? Is it by a supernatural experience? If you look around the world, do a quick Google search, you will find hundreds of businesses that make their money by helping people guide them to a supernatural experience of change. They make huge amounts of money through that. People are looking for change. They want change to be that moment. Unfortunately, those supernatural experiences, even in the Christian world, aren't that common. They do happen, but they're rare. It's normally when the Spirit does a specific and powerful move in someone's life that he'll break away something that they are changed in an instant. But for most of us, the Spirit prompts us that we need to change something and then we need to put in the work to do it. God wants us to press in. He wants us to work through things. And if he just broke everything away from our lives, as amazing as that would be for us, We wouldn't grow in relationship with him. We wouldn't grow in depth of relationship with him because it would just be too easy. Some people to change like to do things like hypnosis. There is a huge business now for people to go and get habits broken off them with hypnosis. I worked with a guy at one point and he'd been trying to quit smoking. He tried over and over and over again and then eventually he went and he had hypnosis. And the person hypnotised him five times And each time he started smoking again because his habit of wanting a cigarette was so strong that it couldn't break off him because hypnosis isn't a fix. 
hypnosis doesn't really do anything. It just makes suggestions into our subconscious, but then it's up to us to follow. Sanctification is so much different. It's not just making subtle suggestions into our subconscious. It's not opening ourselves up to something that's not right. It's about God actually changing the foundation of who we are. When we, are, when we start this process of change, we can't underestimate the power our habits of the power of our habits and decisions. So like this person who kept going back to something he didn't want to do, the power of his habit, which wasn't actually broken off his life, the power of decision meant that he kept going back. It can be the same for us. The Holy Spirit can highlight an area in our lives and say, I really need you to change this. And we can work towards that and we can get to a point where we think we've got it, we're, we're, we're under control. But that habit, if we haven't actually managed to break it off fully, can rear back up and we'll end up back where we were. Habits have such a strong power in our life. I did a little bit of a look and it takes between 18 to 250 days to break a habit. It varies person to person, um, but it takes between 18 and 250 days to break a habit. It's not something that just happens quickly. It is something that we need to really push into, really persevere in. Forming a habit takes about the same amount of time. The same research said that it takes between 18 and 250 days to, to form a habit and to make it so it's there. It takes a minimum of two months before that habit becomes automatic. So it takes two months of doing something over and over and over again before our body just does it without thinking. This can vary person to person, but in most cases, it takes perseverance and commitment. Some people can form habits really easily. Some people can break habits really easily. Others struggle with it. I know personally myself, I can form a habit and I can have a habit going, but breaking that takes a lot less than 18 days. If I stop doing something and I haven't been really pushed into it enough and I stop for one or two days, I find it really hard to get back into it. So for me, breaking that habit can be easy. Forming them can be hard. We need to know what's the be what our natural way is because if we know that we need to start something and it's going to be a slog then we need to go and talk with people and bring them alongside us and get us to get them to support us and encourage us and hold us accountable the same as if we're trying to break a habit we need people around us who are willing to hold us to account because habits have such a strength that they can draw us back to where we don't want to be quicker than we realize they actually have when we form a healthy spiritual habit, it has the ability to strengthen us in more ways than one. Healthy spiritual habits have an ability to strengthen us in more ways than one. They can comfort and strengthen us during a time of trial. If we have a well-formed spiritual habit, then we can draw on that when we're going through challenges. We can take comfort in that as we go through that. It can keep us connected to the Father even when he feels distant. Those times when we think he's far away these spiritual habits help remind us that he isn't, he's just here. If we don't have them set in our lives and that becomes harder. And it can help us stand firm when we face challenges to our faith. This is especially important as we're raising children and as we're teaching new Christians as well because there will come a time where someone will stand there and ask them to justify what they believe and they won't be nice about it. If they have a well-formed spiritual discipline, a well-formed spiritual habit, then they have something to fall back on. They have some, a personal experience and relationship they can draw on. So we do this. That's an odd line. I must have been writing something else and took it out. Taking something, uh, taking something at first that may not take a lot of effort and concentration and making it second nature. So we do it through a spiritual training regime. I know what I was saying now. We do it through a spiritual training regime. So we take something that at first takes a lot of effort, but we've got to, we get it to a point where it take, becomes second nature. Everyone who's decided to learn a new skill knows what this is like. If you're going to start playing sport, a musical instrument, if you're even starting to do something like cooking or baking, all these things initially take effort. 
when we start, the concentration and the effort is huge. When I started learning trombone, uh, and the trombone, you don't have any points to know where you've got it. The slide's just smooth, it just moves. So you learn roughly where you've got to put that slide to get the right sound. And if you get it wrong, you notice. So when you first start, it's a conscious effort of you're here, then you're here, then you're here, and you check, and you go back, and you go down, and you go back, and you would do that over and over again until you get to a point that your body just knows where you need to go. And even now, although I haven't played for 22 odd years, if I pick up my trombone, I know the rough positionings of the slide because I did it for five years, three to four times a week, so I've learnt where it goes. Anyone who plays a guitar or a musical instrument says the same thing. They can just pick it up and they know where, their hands just know where they go. They can just look around, they can, they can do whatever. But to start with, they would have been watching and they would have been very slowly transitioning through the chords. Sport's the same. You watch people as they practise. I saw a video as I was researching this and it's of an NFL bloke and he can catch the ball with one hand, which is pretty impressive because um, I struggle to do it with two. And he does it at a run and he's jumping and he's, he's sliding and he practised. There was a video of him practising and he just runs around and he gets someone to throw him the ball and he just practises catching with one hand. So he's done that over and over again to get himself to that point. With cooking, it's looking, getting to learn what things should look like, what they should smell like before you even have a chance to taste or test. Um, I've mentioned before I love watching The Great British Bake Off and they look in the oven and they go, oh yeah, that's done, and they pull it out and it is. I couldn't do that, I set a timer. When the timer goes off, I spend about five minutes debating whether it's cooked or not. So you learn these things as you go through and we need to do the same in our spiritual life. We need to train our spiritual muscle so we create spiritual muscle memory. That even without thinking, our spiritual habits happen. If it's automatic that the first thing you do when you get up is to start praying and you've done that for so many years and it won't matter what's going on, the first thing you do when you wake up will be to start praying. If you always sit down at a set time in the day and read your Bible, then when you hit that time, you'll automatically be going to that point and it won't matter what you're doing because you'll feel it if you're doing something else and you can't do it at that time, you notice and, and you feel that longing until you're able to actually sit down and do it because our muscle, spiritual muscle memory is telling us that we need to be doing that. In 1 Timothy 4, 6-9... Paul discusses the importance of, of this training, of this spiritual training. So in verse 6, if you put these things, uh, sorry, if you put these things before you, brother, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irrelevant silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, Godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Forming and practising spiritual habits is training ourselves in godliness. They make us focus on the Father and they take our focus away from the world. They take our focus away from things that we shouldn't be looking at and things that we should be avoiding. When we're, when we're in a habit of focusing on the Father, then everything else will seem hollow. So what do these four verses tell us about forming spiritual habits? So in verse 6, I put, if you put these things before you, brother, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained in the words of faith and in good doctrine that you have followed. So we need to train ourselves in words of faith and good doctrine. So how do we do this? We do this through reading our Bible, spending time in our Bible. Uh, we do this by coming to church on a Sunday morning and gathering with like-minded Christians and spending time with them and talking with them and sharing with them. Spending time in the Word, praying over it, drawing everything out that we can. So not just a quick read-through. It's very easy to get caught in the, 
a reading plan where you just skim over what you're reading. And Rod Draper's spoken on this. Sometimes we need to just sit in a passage, spend time in the passage, read through the passage over and over until we've drawn everything that we can out of it. And then when we've done that, go and see what someone else says about that passage. See if they agree with you, if they disagree with you, and then explore the reasons why. Because it's when we do that, we solidify our faith and our stance. So then when we are challenged later on, we've got a very firm foundation to stand on. It can be through formal study in the form of courses. It could be that you're doing, in the old days, it would have been the video Bible course, something like that, or uh, uh, we've done a number of just short courses with people here teaching on specific things. So they're the type of things that help build our spiritual discipline, help train us and build us up in good faith and good doctrine. Verse 7 continues, have nothing to do with irrelevant silly myths. Some versions actually say silly old wives' tales. So that's the type of thing that he's talking about there. Rather, train yourself in godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds a promise for the present life and also for the life to come. When you first sort of read that, I, I thought it was interesting to have nothing to do with irrelevant silly myths because you would think that part of what we should be doing is talking to people who hold those views and trying to, to um, share with them Jesus and share with, him the, with them the truth. But what Paul's saying is having nothing to do with irrelevant silly myths. So what does he mean? In the context of the letter of Timothy, um, Timothy was in Ephesus. Ephesus was an epicentre for a number of Greek and Roman cults. So there was a number that sat there that were all involved and they all would have been at them. So what Paul's telling Timothy is not wasting time trying to disprove what others are saying. So don't waste your time trying to constantly disprove because you could have spent all your time there doing that, explaining why they were wrong, explaining why Jesus was the truth. Rather, what Paul's saying is if you train up the people that you have, if you train up the people that are there, then that will happen as a natural flow on. It will just happen. Expending energy, effort and time that could be spent elsewhere. Also, the other thing that he's saying is there was a number of different Christian views starting to rise up um, with, within the Jewish Christians, within the Gentile Christians. So Paul's also saying to Timothy, don't get sidetracked. Hold true to what I've taught you because it's the truth. Hold true to what you have heard because it's the truth. Don't get caught up shifting your focus from the truth with all these irrelevant and silly myths. So it was sort of a twofold warning for Timothy. And it's the same for us now. It's very easy to get caught and and get shifted from what is the truth because there's so much out there. We need to be discerning in what we read, in what we listen to, in what we watch and where we, where we get our teaching. And that's part of having a strong spiritual foundation and habit because when we do, the spirit will be able to say to us, I don't think you should be watching that or I don't think that's quite right. And it's not that we should avoid these things because we should challenge our beliefs from time to time but it just means that the spirit is able to prompt us so we don't get led down a garden path and we don't find out in 5, 10, 15 years' time that we're no longer reflecting Jesus anymore. Paul deliberately compared spiritual training to physical training. He's deliberately comparing that. He knew that was a time where physical fitness was, it was held up on a high standard. So he's saying... As physical fitness is held up as a high standard by the world at the time, you should be holding up spiritual training to the same level. We train physically to get ourselves ready for a race or to get ourselves into a healthy place for a longer life. And it's the same with spiritual training. We, we spiritually train to get ourselves fit and in a healthy place spiritually. And that will help with our longer life. Paul says spiritual training holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of acceptance. When we spiritually train, when we spend that time, when we're investing in that time, it, it helps with us 
maintaining our Christianity. It helps with us maintaining our beliefs and holding strong to our core. And it holds a promise to enrich our lives now, but also in the life to come. It will enrich our lives now and as we move into heaven. So we need to spend that time. Paul understood that we were creatures of habit that our habits were a reflection of who we are at our core. Philosopher James Smith explains in his book, um, You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit. Our wants and longings and desires are all at the core of our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behaviours flow. What are our habits? Are they good habits? Are they habits that we would be willing to stand up here and say, this is my habit because it's a reflection of Christ? Or is it something that we would probably go, look, I'd prefer not to share that because our habits are what are our wellspring from which our actions and behaviours flow. If we want to be like Christ, act like Christ, reflect Christ, then our habits need to do the same thing because our habits will determine the way we act and think. We can't allow our daily habits to be shaped by the world or incorrect thinking. Healthy, deliberate and consistent spiritual disciplines must shape our daily habits. They will recalibrate our hearts and shift our focus to what God wants us to do. So that's why they're so important because they recalibrate our hearts. They, they take if we've been slightly off, if we've had a bad day or we've, we've done something that, that we shouldn't have and we're, we're struggling with that, spending time in a spiritual habit will just recalibrate our heart and get us back to where we need to be. Spiritual habits could be prayer, they could be meditation, fasting, reading scripture, praise. There are many different disciplines that we could follow that for each one is just something different. It can give us a different input, a different perspective. They are a tool to train ourselves to live a life of godliness. They won't make us live a life of godliness. Spiritual habits and disciplines aren't the be-all and end-all. They are a tool that we can use to bring us closer to the Father. And like any tool, we need to find the one that best suits us, especially when starting to form a spiritual discipline. If you pick a spiritual discipline that really sits, it, it isn't your strength to start with, then you're setting yourself up for failure. If you struggle to read your Bible, don't pick a spiritual discipline that requires you to spend a long time reading your Bible. Otherwise, you're really going to struggle. That might be something that the Spirit prompts you to do later. Whereas if you love praise and worship music, then maybe pick a spiritual discipline that involves praise and worship music and you can commit to that and then the Spirit will start to prompt you and shift you and bring you into where he wants you to be. Once, being, once established, don't be surprised if the Father hands us an unfamiliar tool to try. So once you've got used to using it, don't be afraid if he comes up to you and goes, you know what, you're pretty proficient with that now, I want you to try this. And it might feel odd and it might feel wrong, but that's how growth and change happen, is when the Father comes up and he challenges us and he puts us into an uncomfortable place. So because we've spoken a fair bit, Rod Draper's done, um, spoken on the need for spiritual disciplines. We've done a little bit about spiritual disciplines in the last um, six months. I wanted to try and find a spiritual discipline quiz that would help you identify um, a spiritual discipline that would be best suited for you. Unfortunately, most of the spiritual quizzes I, I found um, were more around what type of spiritual person you are, which has some value as well, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. So what I've done instead is on each of the tables there, I've printed off um, a section from this book, Spiritual Disciples Handbook. Um, I've used this a number of times. I uh, did it as part of a, one of the courses that I did, um, and it's got a number of spiritual disciplines in there. It lays them out really well, helps you sort of go through the process. So what I've done is I've printed off the front page and what it has is it lists 
all the spiritual disciplines, and it gives just a little list. Um, it, it, they call it a desire, but it's really... So what they're saying is, what is your desire? What is, what is the, the thing that really wells up in your heart when you're thinking about spending time with the Lord? What is it? And that's your desire. So you read through that and you find a desire that matches you best. Uh, if you do that um, and you find something that you like, I'll leave this book here at the church. Um, you can come and see me and we'll photocopy off the set page of that. So you've got that to follow. So um, that way you can find one you like and then you can, you can um, get a photocopy of what it wants you to do and then you can start going through that process. So slowly read through the descriptions in the list and find one that speaks to you. That is a good starting point for a spiritual discipline. So uh, Adele Cahoon, who wrote this book, suggests the following process to get the most out of the list. So if you've found something and you're going to sit down and you're going to do it, then this is what she suggests to get the most out of it. Set aside 20 minutes to practice your chosen discipline. Some may take longer but this is a good starting time. So initially just 20 minutes. If you're not used to spending this time, 20 minutes will seem like a long time. Two, pray a short prayer of dedication, such as here I am, Lord, I want to be with you, open me up. Express your desire to be with God. So you're setting the stage straight away. <laughs> Unhurriedly read the scripture preceding your discipline. Each discipline has a scripture with it and let it settle into your heart that you may copy it out. You may want to copy it out and place it somewhere. So if you're someone who learns by writing, write out the scripture. Write it out as you're reading through it. And that'll help really indent it into your heart. Put it up somewhere visually so you can see it. Spend that time just setting yourself up. Turn to the desire at the top of the chart. Thank the Lord for giving you the fuel of desire. Offer your desire and body to Jesus. So this is all about him. <coughs> Acknowledge that while the desire does not entitle you or obligate God, you're open to take the path desire has opened before you. So you acknowledge that, that although you're going to enter in this process, God is not obliged to come and visit with you at that time. Sometimes he might let you go through this two or three times before he starts to reveal something to you because he wants to see that you're committed. Three, follow the guidelines for the practice. Each of them have guidelines in there, um, what they recommend, how you go about doing it, and respond to any invitation that you sense from the Holy Spirit. Don't hurry. You can pick up where you left off another day. So if you're coming towards the end of your 20 minutes and you feel the Holy Spirit really moving in something, but you know you've got two or three points you need to get through, forget about them. Just leave them. Spend time where you are and then just finish at that point because tomorrow when you come back, you can start at that point or you can start again. It's, it's not about being rigid. It's not about locking yourself into a process that conforms you to something. It's about building on a relationship with the Father and using a tool to help you do that. Set aside the last five minutes to respond to God in prayer. Tell God what, you, what it was like for you to practice your spiritual discipline. God's our dad. He just wants to spend time with us. He wants to hear our heart. So spend that time telling him, Lord, geez, that was hard. I don't know where you were, but I was off with the fairies somewhere else over here and, I, Lord, I, I really wasn't concentrating. Be honest with him. If you get something out of it, just open up about what it was that you've got out of it. Express your thoughts and feelings freely. Feelings of gratitude, anger, frustration or impatience. Be honest and open with him because that's what this process is about. Bring it all to God and ask the Holy Spirit to steal in your memory what you need to remember. Make sure that you remember what it is the Lord has brought to you so you don't get a few hours down the track and you see someone, you say, oh, I did this this morning and I had this really great experience and they ask you about it, you go, I can't remember the specifics. So ask the Holy Spirit to seal that in there and if you know that you struggle with memory, take a couple of minutes just to write it out. Take one word or thought with you for the rest of the day. Returning to this word over time develops soul reflexes of the attention to God. So if you take a word or something with you and if you keep going back to that, every time you just 
have a pause moment, go back to what it was that was shared, what it was, then that allows you to start to do that as a natural habit, that when you get to a point, you can just reflect on God and you're always going back there. The practice of noticing God throughout our day shapes the way we live and interact with others. If we get into a habit of seeing God in everything, it makes us, it puts us in a better place. The habit that we put in place that cultivates spiritual formation will bring about change. If we put a habit in place, a spiritual habit in place, it will bring about change in us. We will see a shift. We will see God work in ways that we wouldn't expect. It generally doesn't happen overnight or change us completely into perfect people, but it is a process that is continuing and ongoing. Over time, habits become second nature and we will see change in our lives from the inside out. When we don't put things off, when we trust in the Lord, when we build on our relationship with him, we will see change from the inside out. And more importantly, others will be able to see a reflection of Christ in us. The whole point of sanctification, the whole point of us putting ourselves through this process of change is not just so we become better people, but so we reflect Christ to people. So they have an opportunity to come and become Christian as well, and they have an opportunity to start that process. Everything that we do should be focused on reflecting Christ's love into the world so we can reflect that to people and draw people to him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you've shown us that change is inevitable and that we need to trust in you when it comes, Lord, and that we can either allow it to draw us closer to you or we can allow it to push us further away. So, Father, I just pray today that when that change comes, that we've got such a foundation that we just draw into you stronger. Father, we thank you that we go through a process of sanctification, that the moment we become Christian, you enter our lives and you just start to to work in us and slowly change those things in us that we need to change, slowly making us aware of areas of our life that need shifting, Lord, and then working with us to do that. Father, we just pray that when this process starts, that we don't get caught in the trap of procrastination, that we don't keep putting things off that we need to be doing today, especially if you've asked us to do them today. Father, forgive us for the times when we've ignored you or we've, we've just blatantly gone, okay, Lord, and done nothing with it. We just pray forgiveness for those moments, Lord. Show us, Lord, just highlight to us, if we're starting to get caught in procrastination, just prompt our spirit to just tell us what we're doing so we're able to take it captive and move forward with you. Father, we thank you that there are spiritual disciplines that we can invest in, that we can spend time, and that that although they're, they're a process and they can seem rigid and they can seem like something that's constrictive, The whole purpose of them is to draw into a closer relationship with you. The whole point of them is to to allow us to connect with you in new and different ways and to train ourselves and to prepare ourselves so that we're godly people, Lord. Father, we just thank you for all your promises and we just thank you that through all of this, overriding everything else, Lord, is a fact that you just want to know us and you want us to know you better. So, Lord, today as we go, I just pray that that is what happens, that you, that we just get to know you better and our faith and our foundations are strengthened through that. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like any prayer, please feel free to come forward and we'll pray with you. Um, Otherwise, tea and coffee, join us for a tea and coffee or we'll see you next week. Have a good week.